Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we are talking about Deleuze and Gattari's plateau. In a thousand plateaus, one or several wolves. Picture this. Imagine you are a Swiss psychoanalyst in the early part of the 20th century. And one night you have a dream. It's a dream of bones. It's a dream of skulls. It's a dream of an ossuary. And then you take your dream to your mentor, psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. And you are Carl Jung. And you present this dream to Sigmund Freud, whereupon he says, everything that you've seen in this dream, these bones, really, they symbolize just this one bone or a skull. And now this introduces the problem in psychoanalysis of how do we deal with multiplicity? And why is it the case in Freud's view and in Freudian psychoanalysis that what appears as multiple phenomenally in a dream, a daydream, a fantasy must be reduced to something singular? Deleuze and Guattari are attacking this presupposition. And so today we are going to unpack the ontology of multiplicity. And for that, we brought in an expert of sorts. Well, I say expert, he is a therapist, he is a counselor. You may have heard him before on our Carl Rogers episode. We have Chuck LeBlanc. Chuck, how are you today? I'm doing well, doing well. Great. I'm, uh, I'm living on limited sleep with a newborn. I was going to say running around, but really just thrashing about. I just wanted to say congratulations to you. How's everything going? Good. I'll tell you, it's a very strange experience being a parent and talk about multiplicity and uh, <laughs> intensities. It's a very strange experience being a parent. I mean, I couldn't be happier, but I also uh, do miss sleep. Let's say that right now. Well, one of the things that Deleuze and Guattari talk about in this particular plateau is the experience of love. So maybe we can use some homegrown examples, as it were, to, to unpack how love is a kind of multiplicity. Also on the show today, we have Adam with us. And I just wanted to unpack some of these concepts. First of all, Chuck, this example of Freud and Jung, you know, is kind of a time-honored example. It also illustrates the, the conflict that occurred in the sort of mentor-mentee relationship between Freud and Jung. Either starting with that example of Freud and Jung or anything that you saw in the chapter, what's your take on multiplicity and um, maybe how are you applying these concepts or like, well, what are some examples that that really struck you as being like, ah, I, I get what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to do here? Yeah. How do I put this? So uh, my two favorite chapters in the book is this one and on the refrain that mm -hmm. comes up. So I might end up using a lot of examples from both sides because of how relevant it is in the therapeutic room and this therapeutic space, you know, right off the bat, you can tell when you read the chapter that yes, they are, you know, <laughs> going after Freud with a pitchfork, but they're going after Freud with a pitchfork, flames and reverence at the same time, because of, you know, how he, in a sense, discovered the unconscious or was the first to create the concept in a way. I mean, he wasn't the first, but he was the first to deal with it like this. So you can see that as they're talking about it. And I think that, I mean, in the funny Deleuze way and Guattari, it, with the fire that they go after him, the passion, they try to rip things apart. You can tell how much they respected his work, which I think is kind of a cool way of, of looking at it. But the reason I gravitate towards this chapter is because it's very prevalent even to this today, right? With the reductionist view of uh, psychology, which comes out quite a bit. And that's the first thing that they're going after is how much, how there's a need there for Freud to reduce the multiplicity and unify it because in a sense, he's trying to figure out what he can deal with. How do I, how do I show this? And we know from like a political standpoint, he wanted to make psychology uh, a science. So he wanted to have something to show for it. So what better way than to make a cookie cutter that you can say, see, it's all about daddy, right? Okay. Um, daddy and castration of all things. And you know, you recommended the subversions uh, essay, uh, the book by Guattari. Oh, so soft subversions. The, the soft subversions. Yeah. And I got to read some pieces of that where uh, in one of the chapters, he talks about why he doesn't like Freud. And it has a lot to do with the fact that, well, from a, <laughs> from a therapist's perspective, you're not listening. Mm. That's the thing. You're, you're not listening and you're reinforcing the concept of problems and issues as if there's something, you know, when a client comes in, it's better if I just illustrate my point here. So if a when a client comes in, most of the time, they're coming in, let's say, for anxiety or anger management issues. Let's just use those two. And the belief that they're bringing into the therapy room is that there's something wrong. 
something broken, right? And there's a, a serious lack of understanding of tools and reactions, right? People get angry. Anger is important. And as you start to dive in, if you start to talk to people, okay, we're going to fix your anger management issues. And immediately you're like, yes, you're the incredible Hulk. You don't use your anger properly. And there's something wrong with your brain, <laughs> right? Basically is how this goes. So when you reduce people's problems to problems and issues, that's what they're thinking coming into it. That's the therapeutic tableau. We're going to fix you. But it's rarely, if ever, about that. It's more about, okay, well, what is the expression of the patterns that you've been in for most of your life where this particular expression was called for based on the ecology that you're in? So your environment, your political situation, like all of the things that make you you, which is where I like the multiplicity idea because unconscious as multiplicity means that essentially it's not so simple as Freud puts it. It's just not so simple. People are way more complicated than that. And as a therapist, you can't have a preconceived idea of what's going on when someone comes in because you're not, you're not listening. Anger might look different to everyone you talk to. It might express itself differently. It might mean different things. The concept might uh, just do different things, right? And so well, that's one of the reasons I really like this book. And the concept of multiplicity is because it forces the therapist and the client to be curious about what's happening, not to try mm -hmm. to fix it. It reminds me of another concept that we've been talking about behind the scenes. Deleuze and Guattari have this idea of involution. And the idea of involution means to, to be involved, to be complicated, to be folded in. And it's often the case if we think of things in terms of a problem or think of it in terms of its single factor, a single facet, we often dismiss or remain unaware of those other factors that are in the problem itself. And, and not mm -hmm. all those things are negative on their face. Maybe some of them are, otherwise you wouldn't be in therapy, but it's often about how do we manage the complication and, and perhaps mm -hmm. not leave ourselves exposed to the kind of reduction, to the kind of psychoanalytic reduction. I see this as an instance where something like transference can come in. Right. And this is what, one of the problems that I've always had with Freudian psychoanalysis is the whole psychoanalytic tableau is set up in such a way that it predisposes one to transfer those those issues to the therapist. Once you say everything's about daddy and castration and then there's a single bearded man sitting in the room, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it, it just makes sense that one would then project one's insecurities, one's anxieties onto this figure. Right. And and have everything get mapped onto that singular figure. It's an interesting problem because transference. So, for instance, you know, if we were to talk about uh, one of the things you mentioned in when we were talking about this last time in our reading group was about like origins. Like, let's find the source of the problem. Now, one of the comments that was made, which I agree with, is sometimes it's beneficial to walk down memory lane to find an origin of sorts. Mm -hmm. And I have to put it that way, like, kind of like a spark, but not a point, if that makes sense. It, you can feel relief when you find it. Like, oh, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So it can be a relief uh, from the anxiety of worrying about like, what the hell is going on here? But for a ther if you're a therapist to just go there, okay, this is the origin. You know, when you were four years old, this thing happened and this sparked an adaptation, which led to whatever it is that's going on right now. It's a bit irresponsible to anchor it on to one specific origin, but instead to flip it to pattern because it's learned behavior. These intensities have to happen more than once for something to come out of it. Now, there is moments of spark, and that's something that I, I would argue that when you have a first instance of it and then the pattern begins there, then you have like kind of like the refrain, right? It's reverberations of like, oh, I remember this or oh, I remember this. Maybe not so conscious, but it's maybe uh, like on an unconscious level until it turns into a pattern of behavior of habits and practices that are then used in similar situations. That's what I would consider an, an adaptation. But to bring it back to an origin and then reduce it to one point misses out on the entire story of how these things grow. Mm. Like we were talking about the anger management. Well, maybe you got angry when you were a kid because you're pushed into a corner. <laughs> Situations of bullying, right? Well, if that just happens once, then that's, that's it. It's not going to create like a ripple effect of anger unless it's extremely traumatic, which is a whole other thing. But if it keeps repeating over and over again during your adolescence and you're constantly in fight mode to try to bust mm -hmm. through it, you're going to have a certain relationship to those moments 
in certain relationship to that anger that's going to be carried through into adulthood until you reach a situation where it's no longer like that adaptation doesn't make much sense. Because all patterns are contextualized and they unfold exactly. along contingencies. Yeah, well, let's get Adam in the discussion. Adam, what do you have? Well, I mean, I just wanted to sort of draw on the thread that you were you talking about, Chuck, in terms of the unconscious. I think really the, one of the great moves they make, as well as an anti Oedipus with all, one, se- one or several wolves, is to take the idea that it's very much a Marxian turn of phrase, really, where Marx says that rather than the consciousness of men determining their social being as their social being determines their consciousness. Deleuze and Guattari are saying that rather than the unconscious uh, determining uh, people's social being, it is people's social being, which not only determines their unconscious, but is their unconscious. And this is where the, the idea of multiplicity comes in. And this idea of, of not listening to the analysis on is exactly what happens in the wolf man. I mean, he, Freud declares the wolf man to be cured. That's because the wolf man is... Uh, made into a figure so completely different from the actual man themselves, who eventually get yeah, this this Russian uh, military aristocrat who says, "No, I was never cured. This is this is bullshit." <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, I think this is quite possibly due to the fact that the way in which Freud uh, puts himself into he makes he makes the other into him, he makes Alan Assad into himself through these kinds of free associations, associations which are entirely his. So just to think about. Focus on the wolf's man a little bit. Uh, the idea where the wolves come from. He talks about this dream where there's you know, five or six wolves in a tree staring at him through his window. And Freud makes these, and I'm just going to read them out for the audience because these are some uh, reductions which are wild by Freudian standards, let's say. <laughs> so the, the dream is first associated with a children's tale called The Wolf and the Seven Kid Goats. So uh, most of the wolves get turned into goats. That apparently, given the, in the wolf man's dream, uh, he is hiding in some sort of some sort of clock, and one wolf goes. Then there's five wolves because uh, he may have seen his parents make love at five o'clock, and the Roman numeral V is associated with the erotic spreading of woman's leg. Three wolves. The parents may have made love three times. Two wolves. The first coupling the child may have seen with, with the two parents, more ferarum, or perhaps even even two dogs, basically doggy style. One wolf. The wolf is the father, as we all knew from the start. Zero wolves. He lost his tail. He's not just a castrator, but also castrated. Eventually it is. It's the. Fa- it's not even the father at this point. It's not even one, one wolf. There's zero wolves. The fa- it's the fear that the one wolf will become zero. And it it, 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 so- it sounds um, contrived, listeners. It sounds like a make-up of what Freud actually was. This is the thing of not listening. And it's... So I think the idea of multiplicity comes in so much because it's not just a logical... Uh, it's not just a psychological uh, rejection of, of course, Freud, the emperor. <laughs> but we also have hiding underneath this critique here, Hegel, the devil. Because this is the idea from Hegel that every produced difference is a difference produced dialectically as a moment in the media res of a contradiction which is going to be resolved. It is a unity of identity and difference implicitly, and we need to bring it to the forefront. And this is kind of very much Freud's logic. He comes in knowing what your problem is before or you do, or knowing at the very least the implicit structure of your problem. Um, and of course, you could of course collect these kinds of knowledge in terms of case studies, but it's it's the reductivism of it. And this is why I quite like the idea of the, the sociality coming in here, because of course the wolf man is also a, a wolf only tamed into a domesticated Oedipalized, purely familial being by Freud, but also, as the last Guattari points out, uh, tamed through his uh, ingratiation into the military institution, but not necessarily confined there, because what happens to the Russian military a few, uh, what happens to the Russian military eventually, it becomes a revolutionary uh, Red Army. So this, it's, yeah, I just want to highlight some of the just amazing things about this particular story and just uh, where these critiques end up coming from. So I went a little bit of a, a rant there, but there we go. It's so intensely problematic even just to hear that when you're coming in with it, right? Like Dutari has one of the best, uh, I'm just going to pull it up here. He mentions just one of the best lines, I think, so far in soft subversions. Those with the discourses that are not particularly brilliant and short on razzle-dazzle still manage to hold down a fairly reasonable practice, while inversely those known for distinguished and elegant discourses employed in their monkey-see-monkey-do mimicking of the master often behaved outright irresponsibly in therapy. To take charge of someone's life and direct its outcome, 
all the while running the risk of perhaps having all efforts lead one down a blind alley is a matter of no little significance. And that, the whole Wolfman situation, reading just what Freud was doing to this poor bastard, that's what it is. He's walking in saying, okay, well, I know how to run your life. Or, and this happens all the time, just with training as a therapist, he might have encountered someone that freaked him the fuck out, which mm-hmm. is the, the whole multiplicity thing, right? Where he, he goes far enough, but then kind of goes back into what he knows. I mean, the situation could have been so intense for the, you know, the great Freud that his ego gets in the way. Like, oh, damn, I don't know what to do with this. So everything's your father and it's all about penises. So let's, oh, you're cured. Fantastic. You're a wolfman. I like the, the contrast between this, this figure of, of great sophistication who's coming in and really what they're doing is they're just steamrolling you with their narrative versus mm-hmm. there, there's somebody who's adept with these maybe smaller, more brief kinds of gestures in a therapy space that are more effective or, you know, strike to the core of the issue. I hate to say core. See, that once again compounds this, this image of the monotheism of mm-hmm. the psyche, if you will. I, I think clearly there's, there's a convergence between what Deleuze and Guattari are doing and, you know, somebody like James Hillman, who we've talked about before, where there's a a more pluralist kind of pantheist approach to the way that we deal with dream images, for example, or or fantasies Mm -hmm. or our own self-image because we are implicated multiply. One of the ways that I picture it is when we go to a therapy space and maybe a couple of times that I've done this in my life, it's almost like pulling the thread on a sweater. There's one thread sticking out, but once you start pulling that thing, all other kinds of stuff starts coming out. Going back to the sort of practical dimension of your work, Chuck, what, what, what is that like? How do you know when you're working with a client, for example, what to make contact with, what to push forward, where to hold back? What, what's the sort of general ethos that you have? So for that, that's, I mean, that's mm, such a good question. That's my favorite part of the job because you, you don't, Mm. right? You feel it out is the best, weirdest way to put that. The whole point, basically, this is just spitting a little bit off the last time we talked about Carl Rogers. You know, the, one of the things that I feel lucky that I found him first because it was an accident Mm. was that his obsession was with listening. Foundationally, it was a, a trust in the client. And I would put better word as respecting that the client is their own agent, right? So for me to come in and tell you how to live your life is just incredibly (laughs) disrespectful because I'm not actually listening. So you have stuff going on in you that I don't know. They can't download me into your head to live your actual life. So I don't know how these things are going to go. So what I do instead is create a room of safety, meaning I can handle what you're going to throw at me, right? So if we go in a direction and your body's like, fuck, no, I'm not going there. So you get totally freaked out. The amygdala responds. Well, Mm -hmm. then I can help you regulate your nervous system to come back from that. And that is one external way for me to say, well, okay, we went somewhere that you don't want to go yet. Let's say you're not ready for it, but you tell me that. I don't tell you that, right? Uh, But there's many things that can happen when you're moving towards pulling strings and like boxes are falling out. Uh, there's dissociation. Some people will just like blank out. Some people will speed up in the way they're talking. Sometimes I will start to feel freaked out. And then I have to check in with myself and say like, am I reading, am I reading that from the client? Is that what I'm getting from them? Or is this an area, which I think is what Freud encountered with the Wolfman, is this something that's freaking me out as Mm. a therapist? Do I feel comfortable going here? And what do I do with that? So part of the process, which I find amazing, and this is why I like multiplicity so much, is that it's all an experiment, all of it. And that's the reason why some therapists will come in with a plan because experimenting like this and letting people be who they are is incredibly terrifying. And I was lucky when I started because I was just like a, a naive, enthusiastic guy who happened to read Carl Rogers. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. So I didn't know any better, but I even I had some instances and still do where I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is too much like in instances of like grieving or uh, extreme depression, I can get carried away with it. Mm. And so what, from a practical perspective, what you want to do with this, because I keep saying the word listening, and this is really what I hear with multiplicity, right? Is you want to let, and I think this is what I was getting from the conversations with you about Hillman, 
is you want to let the images, the emotions, the contexts, the concepts, the words, all of it, you want to let them speak. Mm. Come what may, right? You do not want to reduce them. You let them speak because you have absolutely no idea what soup you're cooking when these things show up. Right. But if you're relying on the client and you're respecting and trusting the client, then inevitably something shows up, something happens. So to, that's a bit vague. So let's talk about shame for a minute because shame is a big one. So if we're talking through a client and a lot of their problems that they're encountering have to do with how they're talking to themselves, so they keep shaming themselves, then what we got to figure out is what is the pattern of shame? Where does this show up the most? And it's not trying to find out the problem. It's trying to find out where does this show up in your life? the most simple as that. So then we talk about it and then we talk about the shame itself as if it's a part of you, like whispering in your ear, what is it saying? What are the exact words that it's saying? So you're saying all of this out loud. My job as the navigator is to say it back because a, I need to make sure I heard you. So I can't just say, "Uh uh-huh for 40 minutes because I have, I don't know if I have a clear picture. (laughs) Um, So I have to play it back to see like, okay, I get the picture here. But in that conversation, what ends up happening is you take this entity like shame, which is woven in the fabric of such of a broad life in so many areas, and you make it present. So now it's in front of you, the lights shined on it. Well, in a very cool way, and this is what I take from multiplicity, this is one of the first times that the light has been shone on it. So you're actually talking about it. So you're seeing it from a different angle. What? And then for the client, I'm always thinking like, what's happening now that you're seeing this from another angle? And inevitably, shame takes a different form. I couldn't tell you in this podcast like what form it takes because it's different for everyone. But once they get that form, they can then start to play with it. Mm -hmm. And what they do with it is up to them. And that's kind of how we deal with it. And it's interesting to contrast the idea of play with something like an Oedipal reduction or a symbolic reduction. I mean, this is precisely Mm -hmm. what Hillman's work is about. And once we tap into, you know, something that has intense emotionality behind it, behind those emotions or the character of those emotions, it, you know, inarguably is it, it has a tonality to it. It has a hue. Mm-hmm. It has a specific character. And the symbolic reduction, you know, this is the one thing that James Hillman points out, immediately puts a damper on all of that, right? Mm-hmm. That the intensities as it were, will not bubble up. What happens when things get too intense or, or, or too rough? Because, you know, the argument might be against somebody like Deleuze and Gattari. Well, at the end of all of this, you can make associations all day long. You can guide the person in a certain direction. Like, what, what is the landing pad for them? Or if things go awry, mm-hmm. you know, how does somebody catch their balance? That's right. And that's, so this might be where I differ a little bit. Uh, actually, I was talking to Maria Nishaline about this. Where do you start? So what you have to start with is you have to start with really getting to know the client's goal. Like, mm-hmm. where do you want to go? I can't tell you because it's not my life. And that's that's really has to be respected because I can tell you where I would go with that. But that means nothing for you. Mm-hmm. Um Unless you're in a mentor-mentee situation with similar paths and they're looking for that, which is sometimes that's helpful. But in the end, you have to figure out, okay, well, where are you looking to go with this? So we see the problem. We see how it's affecting you. We see the patterns. What do you want to do about that? And when you figure that out, then you take the exploration as far as the client wants to go with a clear picture of where they intend on landing. And sometimes, most of the time, it doesn't go, you know, every time, I, I would say 80%. When a, when a client is finished and we're done, you know, it's, you've been with me for how many months you go? I, in my head, I'm like, oh, we were just getting started. You know, like I want to keep going, but that's just me, right? It's because um, of curiosity and there's more, there could be more work to be done depending on the goal and how you want to live your life. Because it does come down to, in my opinion, how do you want to live your life, mm. right? So I, I talk a lot about uh, like human flourishing, pursuing the things you have reason to value, respecting how you want to live your life and why you want to live your life and and really hammering in what that means, knowing that these things adapt and evolve over time as you play with them, as you pursue whatever these things are or live in whatever way. But trying to figure that out often helps people 
understand what they want to do with these things. Because at the end of the day, and this is something that I was actually taught by, by Maria, was sometimes when somebody's coming in with your problems, they don't want to get rid of all of it. Mm-hmm. It's not like a cancerous excision, right? You know, anger, anger management. It's not about like <laughs> never being angry again. It's about figuring out the reactions you want to have. How do you want to use it? Keeping those and then shelving the pieces you don't like. The presupposition there is that that anger is somehow radically different. The energy or the emotionality or, or the libidinal force <laughs> that drives your, your mm-hmm. life. Um, I, I, I want to play devil's advocate for just a little bit because let's think against the Lozengatari here. Um, let's say for, for example, that somebody is coming into therapy because, well, let's say that most of the people who are coming into therapy have some significant trauma related to their relationship with their parents, for example. Um, and that mm-hmm. the, the, the play or whatever unfolds in the, the therapeutic space is a performance or an unfolding of some sort of insecure attachment. Um, perhaps even the goals that they come in with are motivated by um, the figure of the parents operating in the background, right? Perhaps the goals that mm-hmm. they have are, are thoroughly conditioned by, you know, things like the word should, um, notions of obligation, all of the things that Deleuze and Gattari, you know, might be against, you know, in the sort of transcendent sense of things. But somebody might argue, well, that's something that, that folks have to, they have to, they have to work on that stuff. Why? Because that's fundamental to all of our mm-hmm. lives, our relationship. We have to get that, that relationship right, or our memory or recall of that situation right. How would you contend with that sort of view? Well, that, see, that's a common one. <laughs> That you encounter is the relationship with the parents. So talk about hodopolization, right? It's your first bonding experience. So this is kind of where the uh, reverberations come in of how you learn to bond with people, um, which is a bit an odd thing to say based on what I just said, but there it is. And so <laughs> it still boils down to the same thing. So I might end up being the losing Tatarian here again and Go quite harsh. <laughs> Re- relationships are, yes, they're parental. So there's like a uh, you could say like a more intense bond, but th- they're still chosen over time and they can feel like not, but they still are chosen. So when you're working with someone in that situation, you want to, it's such a careful and intense thing to work through, especially if you have like narcissistic parents, or if you have parents that use like double binds, like these things or neglectful parents, you know, which, which is going to lead to all different kinds of attachment there's something in the client that wants to maintain that relationship. So let's just add that assumption there. Okay. So what you want to do is you have to go through each and every emotion together, Mm. all of the memories, all of the symbols that are coming up, the goal itself. And then you have to carefully monitor how the goal, where we're going as we're monitoring, as we're exploring each and every aspect of this is the goal shifting as more clarity shows up. Mm. Sometimes it does. Sometimes the end result is a break from the relationship. Sometimes, you know, it's really different depending on the intensity of the situation and the client. But you have to explore every avenue of that because the bond is so intense. Speaking of intensities, right? Like the bond is so intense, it can feel automatic. You know, like when people say you should have good relationships with your parents. It's Mm -hmm. like a should factor. Right. My question would be, who said that? (laughs) Right. Like you're back. Is that a rule or is it just a grieving process that makes you feel that way? Just upsetting. You know, there's little, there's so many avenues to take for that, but they have to all be explored in something as intense as that. I just want to pick up sort of generally about the therapeutic experience in relation to the Lurza Guattari. So that this notion of the goal I really like is as it changes through the therapeutic process, it sort of sheds its uh, shell as kind of a desire for a certain kind of thing. In, and becomes gradually revealed as what it was in the first place, which was a desire to desire differently. And this is all about how we connect to certain social situations or how we connect to our parents. And given that the, uh, sort of the, the process of psychoanalysis in general is to bring things from the unconscious and make them conscious, it seems in a way that we produce uh, a new way of desiring differently is all 
about very much how Deleuze and Atari talk about desire in terms of these connections. If we are you know, caught in these various kinds of uh, little machines of desire, these little connections and uh, feedback responses, input out responses to certain familiar inputs or outputs, it seems like the, this, this notion of the goal very much is this idea of gradually cultivating a desire and revealing to us our little our, our connections, our inputs and outputs responses, our automatic responses. And as Arto said, when you have, when you have made man a body without organs, you will have delivered him all of his automatic responses and restored him to his true freedom. So I just wanted to maybe ask something about the, the you know, focus a little bit on this body without organs here, because the body without organs, as Sir say, is not hostile to organs themselves, but it's hostile to the organization that makes it into a unified organism in the same sense that the, there's always this well of potentiality. And it seems very much that the therapeutic process is this bringing up the connections that we have been implicitly uh, following or yeah, automatic responses for say, um, if, if one is, anxious, they turn to drink, for example, as a, a quick input and output response to put it in mm -hmm. a language of someone like Gregory Bass. And, and the idea is to bring that connection to the forefront, out of the unconscious. And then when you, once, it's, once it's brought out, you can say, you know, do you still want this? Is there still is there a desire to desire differently? And if there is, and that's been mm -hmm. cultivated through the therapeutic process, then the body of our organs and its uh, dis disjunctive function comes in. It's this little circuit breaker which says, well, do you want to desire differently? And I wonder how much the body of our organs as a concept is very much a, it's certainly much a very rudimentary psychological concept for a psychoanalytic practical concept, despite its kind of esotericism that often uh, occurs around this term. First thing I'll say is what the hell is a body without organs? But that's, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, <laughs> I really like that. Cut. Like when I first heard it, it, I racked my brain about it, but I watched something the other day. I think it was, um, Tadis Vindicor, I think was the, the YouTube YouTuber, uh, kind of helped me understand that the body with, without organs, it's just, it's just a thing that gets organized. <laughs> just like you said, right. I just made connections, but it doesn't really want connections. And I was like, well, what does that even mean? Right. If its function is to be connected, but then it doesn't want to be connected. To me, that sounds like nonsense is what that sounds like until you really chew on it right and then you get this concept of and it was mentioned in the, in, in the uh, reading group being locked in so it's not about lacking connection it's about being locked into the connections mm -hmm. body without organs just does its thing right like the wolves the pack of wolves just do their thing the multiplicity just does its thing but it's when you lock it in which is like to label it then that is where the issues start to show up and that's how I take that. So in a therapeutic contest, what, what you're really, what you're doing by what, basically just like in the refrain, you're making the fuzzy visible and then it's digestible and people can figure out what they want to do with it. Cause then they can ask the question, like you mentioned with the goal is like, okay, well now that I know this, how am I feeling about this? Cause the emotions are always going to show up. You don't want to make it too overly cognitive because they all have a place in this. But then when you follow that, you think, okay, well, how do I want to do this differently? You, you mentioned drinking because this one comes up a lot with anxiety uh, and drinking and like the idea of numbing, right? Because alcohol or we can numb the emotions. And then if there was a pattern of difficult emotions that are painful or memories that are painful, alcohol and, and, and we can like take care of that momentarily. Now we know from a biological perspective how that works. But when you're reaching for it from this organizational perspective, you're really just doing what works, but it works in the moment, not in the long term, because it can lead to all kinds of stuff, right? But the long term doesn't matter if you don't understand what the consequences are or you don't care. So in the therapeutic context, what we, the goal is to just see these things as they are. So if I'm working with someone who has like a substance use, uh, is in a substance use situation, then we're just going to look at what it's doing for them. Not, we're not going to look at, oh, it's so bad. Like, look at how it's destroying your liver. Like, that's not my job. But we're looking at, okay, well, when you do this, why is it happening? What does it do for you? Are you satisfied with that? And oftentimes it's no, because that's why they came in. So they're already coming in with that. But once they can make that fuzzy visible and see like, oh, this is, when I do this, it makes me feel better. And it makes me feel better during these particular situations. Then I can ask the question, do you want to do that differently? Is that, is that what we're looking at? 
And then together, because you can't really have the cookie cutter responses for this, we work on, okay, what habits and practices would you rather be engaged in in order to get to the goal of like, let's say, what's the typical response here is emotional regulation because some emotions are too intense. So do you want to learn how to build an emotional regulation response that allows you to deal with that without the alcohol? Is that how we want to do this? And then we practice it and then we see, we experiment. If it works, great. If it's uncomfortable, then we move on until we find one that you're satisfied with. Mm. One of the things that I wanted to tap into, into the text, and I think we talked about this in the reading group a little bit, is this idea of proper names, which, you know, on mm. the face of things, you know, it, it seems rather strange that Deleuze and Gattari would valorize this notion. And uh, I wanted to give my own take on this and then maybe pass it to Adam and then to Chuck to see if there's any way that you think this is usable in, in a therapeutic context. Because what Deleuze and Gattari say is that, and I'll just read it straight out of the text. They say that there are no individual statements there never are. That is to say, collective enunciations, everything that's out there, all, all, all the phrases, all the sentences, all the words are overladen with meaning and have been built up over time as a kind of residue of meaning, of culture, and what have you, and just about everything we say. Every statement is the product of a machinic assemblage. In other words, of collective agents of enunciation. Take collective agents to mean not peoples or societies, but multiplicities. And so that's the interesting difference. The proper name does not designate an individual. It is, on the contrary, when the individual opens up to the multiplicities pervading him or her at the outcome of the most severe operation of depersonalization, that he or she acquires his or her true proper name. The proper name is the instantaneous apprehension of a multiplicity. And this was confusing at first, the first time that I came upon this. Here's an interesting contrast first. Looking at something like an Oedipal reduction, or even taking something like Carl Jung's uh, series of uh, symbologies and typologies, that when we have categories of, you know, of symbols and of types, we can easily just port phenomenon into them and, and, and call it what it is. The problem is there's something that goes into the box and then there's something that doesn't go into the box. But it seems to me that the proper name is more adequate in some ways than the, the symbol or the type in the sense that it names the multiplicity itself. And the, the multiplicity is not something that is insular. It's not something that is complete. It has a fringe. It has a margin. It has particles flying off. It has particles flying off and coming back in, new particles coming into it. Uh, it has a sort of metastable limit, we could say, that there's a point at which the, the multiplicity or the assemblage breaks down. But depending on the kind of multiplicity, there is you know, a, a sense of resilience or plasticity. Think of a burgeoning love romance. Th this is what they talk about in the text as, as a kind of a nomos or a kind of uh, um, pack formation that builds up, a, a convergence of multiplicities when we meet someone for the first time. And, and I always thought this was interesting because when I did do Jungian analysis the first time, I had a series of dreams in which the analyst asked me to name certain figures in the dream. And once I had done that, it it almost gave me chills because it it literally put a name on things that I was feeling. Now, granted, these things were, you know, as, as I said, they were not insular. They were not self-contained by any means imagistically. I mean, there's things that you could do with the images in the image work, which, which could show, you know, their diversity and their complexity. But it was interesting to me to see how something that was complicated could be more easily understood with the application of a name. I don't know if that that is what Deleuze and Gattari are intending here, but I was curious to to hear what Adam's take was on that and then and then maybe Chuck. Ooh, apprehension is a term I, that's doing a lot of work for me in understanding this because the so in anti Oedipus they rely a lot upon uh, so the three sympathies of the unconscious for them. The first one is a total, basically just ripped off that they took the brakes off of one of Kant's three syntheses. And the first synthesis is apprehension, which is this uh, connecting, it is essentially an act of connecting. So an instantaneous apprehension of multiplicity is, is connecting 
uh, a sense of one's belonging to a multiplicity, to a crowd, to a a selection of senses, a selection of qualities, a selection of uh, people. Anyway, and if if we instantaneously apprehend a multiplicity from a point of depersonalization, all this means is that you know, we are we are at this one point uh, not quite belonging. We may be just completely our desire may be completely. We don't know what we want. Love becomes in this insource. So love is an example they give of this kind of multiplicitous attachment, basically from a sense of not really knowing the name of one's desire or not what one's desire is for. This, this this problem can be solved by finding the multiplicity, by finding the the, the crowd of affects and uh, qualities and uh, experiences that your desire ultimately connects to, and then you can name it. It's this kind of thing. You know, what is it? I mean, this mm-hmm. is why um, uh, you know, Jack talks about this actually a little bit. Oh God, I mentioned Jean Jack. Um, <laughs> you know, Coke's advertising campaign. Coke. It's it's just you know, it's just Coke, or it's it. It's the it. It's the connection with this it, with this crowd of of, of energy or crowd of crowd of desiring it. When you can invest yourself into, when you can invest yourself into a selection of objects which you decide, or selection of functions you would like to play in the world, or a selection of comrades, then you can give it a proper name. Say the proper name of comrade, a comrade. The interta- yeah, from from being lost in this milieu of. Uh, you know, with capital, which dehumanizes and sucks all the labor out of us. You know, if we, if we want to reject the proper name of, say, I'm a waiter or I'm a, I'm, I'm this, I'm, I'm, I'm the tech, the, I'm a manager or something. You can depersonalize yourself and fight and connect with this instantaneous apprehension of being that this is it. This is what I want. This is why the, it comes from a state of depersonalization because, because we're always constantly moving for all these circuits of capital all the time. It wants us to be so many different things and fill so many different functions. We are in a state of semi depersonalization the entire time, insofar as our lives are very much precarious. So, of course, many more people than others. But when you find your kind of comrades, there's an instantaneous apprehension of, I've got a sense this is something I want to connect myself to. We want to all collectively assemble our productive capacities, our functions, and reorganize ourselves into this collective uh, enunciation, which says this entire present state of things must be abolished or, you know, uh, a collective uh, uh, fuck off to the current relations of production or the current enunciation of desire for autonomy. Um, it's it's both individual and, and political at the same time. I don't think they want, because obviously they're not reducing, well, they're not trying to establish a dualism between multiplicity and unity. Rather, they want to show how every unity isn't, uh, is, is formed of multiple overlapping uh, assemblages together in the same way that capital, I mean, the same way that every social unit is. Uh, capital is made up of incredible different pri- private interests and private corporations and entire world systems. Unity may be the value form itself, but this unity is the value form created through different assemblages by which the desire for capital is enunciated for more profits this year or for an incredible speculative demand to win the bet on the market, or for an, an imperial desire, uh, of course, in the case of the the enunciations of, of the church or the missionary of the missionary function in in, in colonization, it, it is saying in a ways it is more complicated than that. But only if we if we accept multiplicities here can we not only show where these things attach themselves to each other, such that it appears to be a totality. But also to show where these points of, of difference can be made, and where we can, in a way, find 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 our people, find our desires, and find who we can connect with to embrace this a, a wide crowd. I don't want to say multitude because I don't know. Maybe, maybe it could be a multitude. I'm not sure, but it's it's talking about this. I guess the the swarming of desires that can collectively enunciate what they want in terms of desires for a, a new world if they want to desire differently. And going back to the example of romantic love. I think the idea of a proper name or saying what's happening in a relationship. I mean, how many relationships has there been? A, uh, you know, there's the sort of initial tension. You know, at some point we want to give that a name because it it provides a sense of unity. I, I think one of the ways that we can understand Deleuze and Gattari's sense of unity, or at least Deleuze's sense of, of unity, is through Proust and Signs, where unity is incidental. It's just part of the series. It never overcodes the the multiplicity to the exclusion of new things coming in or old things leaving. I mean, this can certainly happen when we get into certain kinds of relationships 
you know, in Western culture, maybe the world at large now, you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, for example, or a significant other, if you will. And, and, and applying that term to things encapsulates what's happening in the context of that relationship much differently than saying, this person is my husband or wife, which seems to have more, a little bit thicker crust to it. The gap between like the dating phase and the girlfriend, boyfriend phase, if you will, significant other phase. And then the marriage phase, you know, we have escalating forms of, of unity and rigidity. Anyway, all that to say that um, I, I, I like this idea of, of, of the love romance being the sort of paradigmatic example of the multiplicity, because especially the, the, the sort of burgeoning romance, when we meet somebody new and we have some regularity in a routine Meeting somebody really breaks that up. You, you meet the significant other's family, you meet their friends, you're introduced to new hobbies, all sorts of things. And there's, there's new overlaps and it can be exciting in the beginning. It can be overwhelming. And then, you know, at some point that either gets consummated or it does not. And it makes me think of Deleuze and Guattari in Anti Oedipus, where they talk about the three syntheses, the third synthesis being this consummation, this movement of consummation. But there they only talk about it retroactively. Once things have transpired, once a series of desiring production has exhausted itself or reached a certain limit, it's only then that we can go back and say, oh, that's what that thing was. But it seems like what they're saying here in the text is a little bit different than that. But uh, Chuck, I, I wanted you to come in and perhaps say a few things on it. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I'm going to bastardize this or not, but I take that in a, because of the word instantaneous, I took this, I take that in a very Nietzschean way, meaning mm -hmm. in the moment. And that's kind of, if you notice from everything I'm saying, that's how I see the world is like in the moment. So duration has a lot to do with that. And then being present has a lot to do with that, right? And the, with the apprehension, when I think of multiplicities, what I'm, what I think about is like all of the different particles bouncing around, mm -hmm. which I take to be, Everything that made that the virtual of me, right? The affects, the situations, the like experiences, everything that's in there. And so when you give it a proper name, then it's encapsulated. Like, mm -hmm. boom, these are the things that show up, right? So, for, uh, for instance, you know, when my daughter was born, I became a dad, right? Mm -hmm. But that didn't like for a Pokemon, I didn't need a hard candy and evolve into a dad. <laughs> right. I'm still the same guy. It's just the situation has changed now, right? Uh, my daughter has shown up. There's, you know, we walked in the hospital with two people and three people showed up, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I don't have a manual. I have no idea how to keep this thing alive. And it's my responsibility because who thought of that? Anyway, whatever. Mm -hmm. But there was something, it's amazing to talk about because something f changed the minute I found out my wife was pregnant and leading up. And I can't describe what did other than the situation, but how I saw the world was now different. How I talked about it, the things, mm -hmm. my desires, my values started to shift and, and, and just change, right? But it's in the moment, right? And that just intensified when Rose showed up, right? When I saw her for the first time and every single day. But for me, when I see instantaneous, it's because when the situation has changed, I am now in the moment of dead, acting like being part of choosing so this is this, this piece that's in there but it changes from day to day like when i'm in a, a therapeutic space right well i'm a therapist and so all of those constellations show up mm -hmm. so what i like and i'm not sure if i even got it right but what i like about Deleuze and guitar is that they really respect the the flow the flow of those territories maybe you can say because they change moment to moment but then certain proper names will we'll say, uh, don't, right? I'm a dad. And for long as Rose is around, I act like a dad, mm. right? If something awful happens, like she passes away, I was a dad, right? Like it's still, these pieces, these constellations are still present, but it has a lot to do with the way I'm thinking, acting and being in the world and has changed according to the situation. So that's how I see that. Well, Chuck, I know that you have to go in a little bit before we leave I wanted you to plug your podcast, Couch to Couch. Let us know what happens there and where we can find it. Awesome. So, yeah, so I have a podcast, Couch to Couch, Making Therapy Make Sense with Chuck LeBlanc. Uh, we're on a hiatus. I'm going to be recording again in November because I took some, some time off because learning how to keep a tiny human alive is complicated. 
basically the whole point of the the podcast was to make therapy more digestible. And what I meant by that is I don't like the power dynamic when you're walking in, you're, tra- you're looking at like psychology today and you're like, what kind of therapist do I need? CBT, DBT, you know, FPC, like I made that one up, but like all these credentials are there. And if you've never been to therapy before, you don't know what the hell any of that means. And, you know, a therapist can have a nice write-up, but you can never get the experience of actually meeting them human to human. So what I thought was I would make a digestible podcast where we get two therapists together as if we're having like coffee with a friend. And we just talk about the bits of therapy that we are passionate about. Mm. And that's it. So that people can get an instance of it. And what ends up, what has ended up happening, this has evolved over time, where I went from that to uh, now interacting with people who are not necessarily therapists. Uh, I do therapists, you know, talk to them as well. But people who are in psychology that might be like academics or philosophers, like this is what I'll be going to in the future. Because for me, as most of my clients know, and now people who listen to the podcast, I'm a philosopher first, therapist second, it all mixes together. Mm. What I like to do is to give people more of an understanding of why that is. Because I think that, uh, you know, psychology came from philosophy and it's a lineage that is extremely cool to explore. And so we'll be getting to that into the future as well. So it's kind of evolved over time. Uh, But that's really what you can look forward to when you hear it. A lot of Deleuze talk. I'll tell you that right now. And you can find me on Spotify. I'm, I'm on a lot of them. Spotify, Anchor, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Music. You can hear the podcast on the Alexa, which I thought was the coolest thing ever. I bugged people with that like you wouldn't <laughs> believe. Um, and that's where you can find me. And we'll be recording again starting season three in November. Definitely check out one of his recent episodes with uh, Dr. Maria Nicholine. Uh, she does a lot about Gregory, ba- Gregory Batterson as well, and his psychological cybernetics is incredibly important, of course, for how Deleuze and Guattari talk about the self as connected to the wider environment too. So absolutely check that out. If, if, if you're coming straight from this, then explore the rest of the wider catalog, of course. She is the author of Deleuze and Psychology, which is when she's the, one of the authors of it. And when she agreed to come on, I uh, if I could do a backflip, I would have. That was <laughs> one of it. One of the wildest conversations I've had so far. Great. And Chuck is an active member of our reading group. And so if you want to get involved with the reading group, just head to the show notes. That's where you're going to find Chuck's podcast, our reading group, and other links from us. So just wanted to say thanks to everybody today, and we'll see you next time.